Up next on the TWIP Network, Gordon Lang and I start 2016 with a review of the entire field of Micro Four Thirds lenses on All About the Gear. Hello, it's Doug Kay, and I'm here with Gordon Lang, and we're going to start 2016 with a wrap-up or a review of essentially everything you ever wanted to know about Micro Four Thirds lenses. Hey, Gordon, how are you? I'm good, Doug. How are you? I'm doing very well. Um, we've got rain this year here in California, so it's very exciting. Um, yeah, we've, we've, had it, we've had it before in England. Um, uh, we, thought, we thought you might like some of it. We're yeah, familiar. Yeah, we're yes. familiar. I, in fact, I'm about to get very tired of it, but that's okay. <laughs> hey, this is something that we, you and I have wanted to do for a long time. Um, you've, you're a big fan of the whole Micro Four Thirds world. I've reviewed a number of Micro Four Thirds camera, but I've never owned one. So uh, this is going to be uh, uh, really interesting. Um, Talk to us a little bit about the the background of Micro Four Thirds in general. Where did that all come from, and, and how did we get to where we are? Okay, Micro Four Thirds is a mirrorless camera format. And if you're into cameras, you might still think that mirrorless is quite a new technology. And it is for some companies, but not for Micro Four Thirds. Believe it or not, that standard was announced in August 2008, and now we're in 2016. So it's getting on for seven and a half years old at the point that we recorded this video. So it's pretty established. That is one of the things that makes it unique. It was the first mainstream mirrorless camera format. The other thing that makes it unique is that there isn't just one company behind it. There are two main companies driving this format, and they are Olympus and Panasonic. They jointly developed the format, and this has given it a unique advantage over the competition. First of all, it was first to market by over a year before even Sony came to market with what it called NEX in, back in those days. But secondly, you've got not just one, but two major manufacturers developing for it. So you've got two companies producing lenses at the same time. And uniquely, because of course, you know, you could say, hey, hang on a minute, I've got a Canon DSLR and I can buy lenses from Sigma and Tamron and Canon and all manner of people. That's fine. But only Canon makes Canon cameras with an EF mount. In contrast, Micro Four Thirds has got bodies that are built by Panasonic and Olympus. And if you're into filming, there are other companies like Blackmagic and, and other companies besides them, which are also doing Micro Four Thirds bodies. So you've actually got this unique system where you've got lenses that have been developed for many, many years, specifically for this format, but also the choice of bodies. And we've seen Olympus and Panasonic go in slightly different routes. Uh, Olympus routes, yeah, and routes. Um, directions. Olympus has taken a lot of inspiration from its fantastic film camera heritage and it's produced bodies with beautiful retro styling but it's not retro for retro's sake they're still very very functional cameras and they've also really pioneered uh, built-in image stabilization this is where they actually shift the sensor to counteract wobbles and it works with any lens you attach Meanwhile, Panasonic prefers optical stabilization on its lenses, but it's been really pioneering in the field of video, particularly in 4K video. So you've got these two different manufacturers producing two quite different types of bodies, but which are compatible with the same lenses to a point that a typical Micro Four Thirds owner like myself might in, might in fact own bodies by both manufacturers. One that's great for video, say from Panasonic, one that's great for stills and with the built-in stabilization from Olympus. And it was all of this put together, which is what made me adopt Micro Four Thirds as one of the main systems that I use for my personal work. And I've been shooting with it pretty much since about 2009. So for me, mirrorless and Micro Four Thirds is something that I've been shooting with for a very, very long time. All right, and we should we should explain before we get into the lenses in particular that the Micro Four Thirds standard, of course, uh, describes the lens mount and the interconnection between the lenses and the bodies, but it's also a standard sensor size, and that sensor size is approximately 50% the height and 50% the width of what we call a full frame uh, sensor. And what that means is that in terms of field of view, the focal lengths are approximately two to one. So whereas in a full frame camera, as we call it, a 50 millimeter might be considered a standard lens, a 25 millimeter lens 
on a micro four thirds will give you approximately the same field of view. And as we talk about the lenses today, we're going to use the native focal length. So when we refer to a 25 millimeter lens, it will be an actual 25 millimeter lens. But for you people coming from big cameras, uh, that would look like a 50 to you, at least in terms of the field of view. And likewise, that works the other way around. So say if you're coming from a full frame system and you think, you know what, my favorite focal length is about 100 millimeter, then in micro four thirds, you'd be looking for a 50 millimeter lens. I should also mention that in terms of depth of field, if you're used to a particular depth of field on full frame, then that two times reduction also applies to that. So if you're used to how f2.8 looks, this is not in terms of light gathering or exposure, just in terms of depth of field. If you're used to how that, look, how that looks on full on micro four thirds you'd need half the value so if you like the look of f 2.8 on full frame then you'll need f 1.4 on micro four thirds so an easy comparison if you've got a 50 millimeter f 2.8 lens on full frame and you want to match that depth of field and coverage you're looking for a 25 millimeter f 1.4 lens on micro four thirds it's a little bit confusing but you get used to it in the end and I want to throw out one thing before we get started. We will get into the lenses, I promise. But, you know, years ago, it used to be that if you bought a lens, you were afraid to use it wide open. You know, if you bought an F1.8 lens, people would say, oh, it's not sharp at F1.8. You have to stop it down to at least 2.8 or F4. That's not really the case any longer. Lens manufacturers now, in my opinion, are making lenses that really are good enough to shoot wide open. Would you agree in general? Definitely. And this is one of the major benefits of micro four thirds. A lot of people coming from larger formats, say full frame, would say, oh, a sensor, that's a quarter of the surface area full frame. It's not going to be as good at high, as high ISOs. And that is absolutely correct. It isn't as good because the pixels simply don't have the same surface area. But the major benefit is that it is easier to make lenses that are sharp right up to the corners of that frame. And it's easy to make lenses that not only perform well up to the corners, but they're smaller, they're lighter and they're cheaper. So not only are they performing well at their maximum apertures, but they're small, light, and cheap. And this allows you to produce a system that is so much smaller and more portable. And when you couple that on, say, an Olympus body with stabilization, it allows you to shoot in situations which were pretty much unheard of with unstabilized full-frame formats. For example, with my Olympus OMD EM1, I'm glancing over here, I might as well pick it up. This is the EM1, which is the camera I use for most of my personal work. I've got it with a lens I'll tell you about in a moment. We are going to talk about the lenses. Uh, with this camera, when I've got, a say, a 24 millimeter equivalent, so that's a 12 mil lens on this format, I can actually hand hold that at one second with this camera. And this is with my shaky coffee hands. One second exposures. That means that I can shoot at low eyes. I don't care about 800 or 1600 ISO not looking great on this. Sure, if I'm shooting action, you know, in low light, that is a bit of a problem, but I'm shooting buildings, they're not going anywhere, or landscapes. So I can actually shoot at the lowest ISO setting on this, even during the blue hour. Nice low ISOs, brilliant lens quality. I'm doing it all handheld, no need to set up a tripod. I'm running around grabbing a lot more shots than I would had I been using a tripod. So Micro Four Thirds has really changed the way that I uh, approach my photography for the better. It's a lot more fun. I'm getting a lot more successful images. Okay, so when a person gets their first camera, Micro Four Thirds or otherwise, they probably buy the camera with a kit zoom. What, what are the kit zooms that we're likely to encounter in the Micro Four Thirds world, and are they any good? Yeah, well, most of the time on the Olympus side of things, unless you're going for one of their higher end bodies, you'd probably be getting their collapsing 14 to 42 millimeter kit zoom. Now, it's OK, 14 to 42. Remember to times it by two, that becomes 28 to 84 millimeter equivalent. It's a fair range. And because it's a collapsing design, it shrinks down when it's powered off. So it's very, very compact. It's great if you want a compact body, although the quality inevitably suffers a bit. For me, the best affordable kit zoom in Micro Four Thirds is the Panasonic 14-42. It doesn't collapse, although it is very, very small, but it is just sharp into the corners. It is very, very good quality. If you're going for a higher end body though, uh, both Panasonic and Olympus do some really, really nice lenses that are weather sealed and brighter. Uh, Panasonic has a 12 to 35. So that becomes 24 to 70. And Olympus has a 12 to 40. So that becomes 24 to 80. Reaches that little bit further. Both of those are f2.8, constant focal ratio throughout their range. And they're both weather sealed. They're really, really nice 
lenses for general purpose use if you've got one of the higher end bodies. So typically, if you were to go for something like the EM1 or from Panasonic side, say the GH4, then you would be coupling it if you wanted to kit zoom with one of those. But for me, it's all about the prime lenses. So the lenses that I'm going to recommend that people go for next, or maybe even instead of a kit zoom, are going to mostly be fixed focal length lenses. They're shorter, they're lighter, they're brighter. And in terms of micro four thirds, as you know, with that depth of field not being quite as shallow as on full frame at the same F number values, really primes the way to go if you want to have some control over depth of field. Okay, and uh, I've got U.S. prices here, which I'll try and uh, help people out with. To, to recap war, um, what uh, Gordon just said, that Panasonic 14 to 42 costs $245 if you buy it uh, by itself, not as a kit lens. So it's it's quite a bargain. Um, the other two lenses that Gordon mentioned, the weather-sealed ones, the Panasonic 12 to 35 comes in at about $750, and the Olympus 12 to 40 is about $800. So... Um, Quite a bargain for the 14 to 42. Um, and Gordon, would you suggest people buy cameras without kit lenses if they can't get them with kit? This, with kit, sorry, buy them without kit lenses and then add these if that's all they can do. Is that the best solution? I always recommend that people buy a camera with a kit zoom, partly because the companies normally subsidize them a bit. So that that value, that price that you quoted for the 14 to 42, it would be considerably less than that if you bought it with a Panasonic body. Uh, so it becomes a kind of no-brainer price-wise. It gives you an emergency lens to use. Uh, if, you, you know, if you're know, if you being a bit of a snob like me and you go, oh, no, I only use primes. Well, you know, if it's chucking it down with rain or you're going to be going to some environment you don't particularly trust, then sure, ch chuck on that kit zoom because you don't care that much about it. It's also a great lens to get you started. If it's your first lens, it will teach you whether you want to go wider, longer, closer, or brighter so they're very very good to teach you about what lens to get next people are always saying to me when they buy their first camera what should i get for my second lens i say don't get anything yet use the kit zoom for a bit because the lens you think you want may not end up being the lens that you actually need most people gravitate towards getting a telephoto zoom as their second lens but what happens if they get hooked on wide angle or micro photography or portrait photography and they want a shallower depth of field then the telephoto zoom may not be the ideal choice for them I would also say that it's a lot easier to sell a body with a kit zoom than body alone. So when it comes to upgrading your camera and you want to sell it, it makes it more attractive if you've got a lens to go with it. So go for the kit zoom if you see it's an option and it doesn't add much to the price. Very good. Okay, we're going to start with the shorter focal lengths, the wider angle lenses, and work our way up to those long telephotos. Let's start with fish eyes, Gordon. What are your favorites in the fish eye department? Well, isn't it amazing that there is even a choice? This is one of the major benefits of the Micro Four Thirds system is that not only are almost all focal lengths covered in this catalog, but they're covered with typically two or even three different choices at each popular focal length. And this is when a lot of rival mirrorless formats may only have one uh, option at that focal length or even none at all. So with starting with the fisheye, believe it or not, there are three fisheye choices for Micro Four Thirds. Uh, Panasonic came out with one very early on, an 8mm f3.5 with autofocus. A while after that, Samyang, which is a, a Korean company known for their manual focus lenses that are very affordable, because if you don't actually know about how camera man licensing works, you actually pay extra if you want autofocus. So let's say Doug K wants to start producing his own lenses in the Canon mount. He's going to have to pay more if he wants them to be autofocus. But if they're only manual focus, he doesn't have to pay as big a license. And that is one of the reasons why Samyang lenses are manual focus. And that in turn means why they're also quite affordable. But they're very good quality. Uh, this is a lens that I bought myself. This is their 7.5 millimeter fisheye. It's uh, f3.5, so it's not particularly bright, but it's very, very affordable. Uh, Doug, what price have you got on this lens? The Samyang is about $270 US. Okay, the quality is pretty good. Even wide open, it doesn't soften that much in the corners, but if you stop it down, and it is a manual aperture ring you've got on this lens, stop it down just really to f4 or ideally f5.6, and it becomes very, very crisp. And look at the size of it. It is really very, very small. I can stick this on there on the camera and it is brilliant in, in tight interiors like a cathedral or if you're into filming action uh, like uh, skateboarding and snowboarding, you can get really up close with it. And of course, 
like most mirrorless cameras, the Olympus Panasonic bodies have got focus peaking, so it's very easy to focus this thing too. However, it is not my premium choice. My premium choice is this, and this is quite a unique lens already. This is a much newer lens. It is the Olympus 8mm fisheye. You'll notice straight away it's about twice the height of the Samyang, and the reason for that is that this lens has an f1.8 focal ratio. It is the brightest fisheye around. Now, what this means is that even with the small micro four thirds sensor, if you get quite close to your subject, you can actually achieve a slightly blurred background with this. Um, so there are shallow depth of field effects that you can achieve with it. But more importantly, it lets you shoot in such low light, especially when mounted on an Olympus body with built-in stabilization, particularly when you're doing things like filming video. Again, if you look at those skateboarding situations, I see so many people filming these around, say, places like San Francisco or where I live in Brighton. And typically they might have like a Canon uh, 5D Mark III rig with um, one of Canon's many fisheye lenses. They're not stabilized. So you need to have quite a big stabilization rig to carry that. And of course, the whole thing becomes quite heavy and unwieldy. Alternatively, you could mount this Olympus uh, 1.8 fisheye on one of the Olympus bodies with stabilization. It's much smaller. It's a stabilized rig. And because it's a bright lens, you're shooting at a low ISO for good quality, even in low light. So again, this whole idea that Micro Four Thirds with its smaller sensor has lower um, noise performance or rather inferior noise performance, it all becomes null and void when you're shooting at low ISOs anyway because you've got nice bright lenses. So for me, this, this fisheye has become actually very, very practical. I, I take it on all my trips and I really, really like it. Very, very sharp, up to the corners, even at f1.8. Okay, so that uh, Olympus F1.8 fisheye is about $800. Slightly below that is that Panasonic you mentioned, the um, 8mm F3.5 at $600, and the Samyang is the real bargain at $270. We should point out also that um, at F3.5 on that Samyang, and given the very wide angle, manual focus really isn't a problem. You really don't really, I would say, you don't really need autofocus um, with a lens like that. So uh, if you're budget conscious, take a look at that Samyang. Okay, let's go to what we would call ultra-wide lenses. We're not fisheye. One of those, we're not that sort of strange fisheye look, but we're very wide angle. What do you like in that category? Okay, well, one of the things that most appealed to me about Micro Four Thirds when it first launched, when a new format launches, everyone looks not just to the body, but to the lenses. What do they launch it with? Most people launch a system with a basic kit zoom and at least one bright prime lens that you can use as a general purpose or a portrait type lens. But Panasonic came out very, very early on in Micro Four Thirds with an ultra wide zoom. Now, a lot of other formats, for example, Sony um, and Fujifilm, kept their users waiting quite a long time before they brought out an ultra wide zoom. But Panasonic was there very early on with this. This is the seven to 14 millimeter. So that becomes 14 to 28 uh, millimeter F4. It's a constant focal ratio. This lens is brilliant. It's tiny. It, it's very small. It's very light. Like a lot of ultra wide zooms, you can't put a uh, filter on it without a, a bulky adapter, but there are ways around that. Um, and this was one of the first lenses I bought. And one of the reasons I actually invested in Micro Four Thirds to start with, I, I really love this lens. It's very, very sharp right up into the corners. You're going to hear me say this throughout this video, but that's one of the benefits of Micro Four Thirds across its entire focal range, whether you're shooting at 7 or 14 millimeter. There is only one problem with this lens, which is that it suffers from some flare issues, which means if you're pointing it at very bright lights, then you may see some bluey purple artifacts, some little flare reflections. Sometimes they're easy to retouch out. Sometimes you don't notice them. Sometimes they're horrendous. It's one of those things where when you know where to look for it, you see it, but when you don't know about it, you don't notice it. So let's pretend it's not there. This is an option still. However, if you've got more money to spend, there is this, which is the Olympus. This is a much newer lens. This is again, seven to 14 millimeter, except it's F 2.8 all the way. Now let me compare these sizes for you if you're watching the video. The Olympus one again has the bulbous front end. You can't mount filters on the front. And it is quite a lot taller and quite a lot heavier. However, you've got that aperture that's one stop brighter. Again, I've used this lens for a lot of handheld shooting on the Olympus bodies. It is great in low light. You don't need to stop it down for sharp quality in the corners. And best of all, it avoids those flare issues of the Lumix 7-14. However, 
it is more expensive. Doug, what are the prices of those two lenses? Uh, the F4 from Panasonic is $800 US, and the F2.8 from Olympus is 1100 both fantastic options. I, if you if you can afford it and you've got one of the larger bodies with a bigger grip, I would go for the Olympus. Uh, but there's still nothing wrong with this uh, Lumix 714 apart from the flare issues. And since the Olympus came out, I think quite a few people sold these lenses. So there's a good option to look for these second hand. If you're flying a, a, a drone, a lot of people really like the Panasonic bodies because they've got great video and they do some smaller ones you can mount on drones. Zooms are not ideal. Fixed focals are better. And um, Olympus does a 12 millimeter F2, so that's a 24 mil equivalent. That is a nice wide prime lens, but I would sooner have one of these zooms. They're one of the only zooms in my system. Now, if I really needed, uh, I should point out, both of the lenses you show are very reminiscent of the famous Nikon 14 to 24. They look at, they've got that bulbous front end. They don't take filters. I wish I had mine still. I wish I owned it. I could show you a comparison because that Nikon 14 to 24 is massive in size compared to the two that you just held up there. But one of the problems with that 14 to 24 was that you couldn't put filters on it. And that's still one of the challenges with those two. I think there's also an Olympus 9 to 18. Is that correct? That is correct. So that's not quite as wide, but still pretty wide. And the benefit of the Olympus is not only is it uh, cheaper than either of those, but it can also take front mounted filters. Okay, very good. And that comes in at around $500. So these are these are great lenses for that ultra wide look. And um, again, if you're, if you're coming from Nikon and your wrists are tired, this is the place to go, you'll get something that that feels very familiar to you visually. All right, let's uh, let's move to what we consider, I guess, the sort of standard wide-angle lens. Uh, not quite as severe as these ultras, um, you know. And there's so much, there's so much choice. I mean, already, you know, there's there were three ultra-wide zooms available. If you're on the Fujifilm system, there's only one ultra-wide zoom. Fortunately, it's very good. But in micro four thirds, there are three to choose from. And when you go to the standard wide to standard coverage, the the choice just explodes in this format. There are so uh, many options. I'll bet you're going to make it easier by limiting the number of choices, by saving us the trouble of going through all the myriad of wide-angle lenses. What would you pick? Okay, well, the, the lens that I did actually pick, let me find it for you here. This is the one I use. This is the Olympus 17mm f1.8. 17 times 2 is 34, so it's close to that classic 35mm focal length. Again, very, very small. Um, I should point out that some of these lenses I'm holding up are silver. Olympus typically does them in silver or black, so you can put them on there that, you know, you can match your, your body color if you want. And again, just to remind you, the Olympus lenses work on Panasonic bodies. The Panasonic lenses work on Olympus bodies. It is, that's the beauty of them sharing the same standard. So the 17mm 1.8 is a great standard wide angle. I often leave this, if I'm only going out with one lens, this is often the one I'll use. However, Panasonic also has a really nice option with the 15 millimeter F1.7. So that's sl uh, slightly wider, 30 mil equivalent. And for me, was slightly better quality as well. Now I'm going to open a small can of worms uh, for Doug here. The 15 millimeter um, Lumix lens is the first lens we've mentioned that is branded to some extent by Leica. Yeah, yeah. I, I did a review of some of the early Leica branded lenses that Panasonic Lumix uses, and I came up with the phrase Lino, Leica in name only. Now, I had a lot of flack from that. The Panasonic people were very good, and were, they worked with me to understand the differences. The Lumix fans went ballistic. Um, what we've got here is uh, an engineering and marketing partnership between Panasonic and Leica. And in fact, Leica has a great deal of input on the design and manufacturing of the lenses. However, they're not made in Germany at the Leica factory. Uh, this is definitely a Panasonic product. Um, so let's let's say it's it it is Leica in name only, but there are real benefits, and these are some excellent excellent lenses. This, the Olympus 17 millimeter, four hundred dollars. Uh, the Lumix, the Leica Lumix Panasonic 15 millimeter, six hundred dollars, a fifty percent premium. Um, I've used that uh, 15 millimeter and it is a gorgeous lens, I have to admit. Okay, so moving on to standard lenses. Again, lots of choice. So by standard, we mean roughly equivalent to the magnification of the human eye, which as we know from the full frame world is a 50 mil equivalent. So in micro four thirds, it's 
25 millimeter and there are two uh, main choices now back in the day when the format first launched panasonic had a 20 millimeter f17 i think lens that was a pancake lens very small nice lens but shortly after that there was another like a lumix uh, collaboration which was a 25 millimeter f1.4 and that is what i have here on my omd em1 with a uh, a nice leica square lens hood it's not the most effective lens hood i should say but it's effective in looking looks very really cool. good it's very cool i do like that and of course it comes off it just doesn't reverse back on that's that's one of its failings but this lens is lovely now it may be one of the first lenses in the system but it still produces beautiful, beautiful results. So 25 millimeter f1.4 is going to be equivalent in coverage and depth of field to a 50 mil f2.8. Now that may not sound like it's going to achieve that shallow depth of field compared to full frame, you know, f2.8. But if you speak to most full frame users, they'll be going, oh, I wouldn't use my, you know, f1.8 lens fully wide open. There's nothing in focus at all. I stop it down at least to f2.8. And at that point, you're getting beautiful results. I use this for all of my product photography, pretty much. So if you go to cameralabs.com and you see any of the photos of the cameras in my reviews with the nice blurry lights in the background next to the coffee cups and things like that, this is the system I'm using. The Lumix, like a Lumix 25mm 1.4 on the Olympus OMD EM1. Beautiful, beautiful combination. I also use this as a portrait lens. It focuses fairly closely. It's if you're happy to get reasonably close to your subject, say if they're kids or people who you know pretty well, uh, because of that focal length, you do have to get quite close. It gives a more of a kind of intimate portrait uh, scenario. And I really, really like it. The rendering is what makes this lens very special. The colors and the shapes, the bokeh, I'm going to use that word, is just very, very attractive on this. However, uh, Olympus has since released a 25 millimeter F 1.8. That is also very good. And I believe comes in at a lower price. But for me, if you can afford it, the uh, Leica Lumix 25 1.4 is still a gorgeous lens. Yeah, there's about a two to one ratio in cost here. The, the Leica Lumix is $600 US and the Olympus F 1.8 is $300, quite, quite a bit cheaper. But I'll tell you, Again, I have nowhere near the experience that, Gordon, you have with these lenses. I've used just a fraction of them for my reviews. But I can remember when that, um, that Leica Lumix 25 came out. It was one of the first lenses that I tested. And I agree with you completely. Shooting that lens wide open, um, sort, of a, sort of normal focal length portraiture lens, working indoors in low light, just a beautiful lens. One of my favorites. Well. It's time to, to move into the world of mild telephotos, if you will. And let's again, go, let's go lots there. of choice. Lots of choice in the Micro Four Thirds format. Olympus kicked off this very early on with this lens. This is a classic lens, the uh, 45 millimeter f1.8. Look at the size of this lens. It's tiny. So 45 millimeter, that is going to be 90 mil equivalent. That is uh, a short telephoto. It's the classic portrait length so you can stand back a bit not as far as a 135 equivalent is it's a really really nice focal length for portraits this lens uh, f1.8 is very capable of blurring the background for very very nice shallow depth of field effects for a while i described this lens as an absolute no-brainer if you had a micro four thirds camera you had to buy this lens you have no choice that was it however uh, since it came out there have been a couple of other options worth considering one of them is spectacularly expensive. Um, another Leica Lumix collaboration. Oh, I should probably point out at this point that so far all of these Olympus lenses are unstabilized because Olympus puts stabilization in their body. So when you put one of these Olympus lenses on a Panasonic body, unless you've got one of the few Panasonic bodies with built-in stabilization, then you don't have a stabilized combination. That may or may not be an issue for you. Some of the Panasonic lenses have optical stabilization. When they have, I will mention it so far, uh, the 25 millimeter 1.4 does not. Um, so that brings me back to the Leica Lumix 42.5 millimeter. So that becomes 85 equivalent. F1.2, count it, F1.2. One of the brightest lenses in the Micro Four Thirds system. Although again, in full frame equivalent terms, before we get too excited, it's like having F2.4 in terms of equivalent depth of field, but it's still shallower than the rest of these. It is a large and heavy and expensive lens. It does have optical stabilization. 
it is all about producing not just an extremely sharp image across the frame, even at f1.2, but about beautiful, beautiful, beautiful rendering. Now, you may think the 4518 produces lovely rendering, and it does. But when you put it next to that uh, 42.5 1.2, which Leica calls the Noctichron, on the account that it can work in very low light, it, it's just a big step up. The rendering looks really beautiful. And it's one of those things where bokeh fanatics on a big budget will go, I'm going to get that lens because I love the look of it. I love the contrast. I love the color. I love the rendering. Everyone else will go, what are they talking about? You know, it's this is so much cheaper just by this one. Look at this. Look at the size of it. It doesn't weigh anything either. It's tiny. But since then, Panasonic has also produced another option which targets this lens directly. It is another 42.5 millimeter focal length. F1.7 focal ratio. It also has optical stabilization, which is great if you've got a Panasonic body. Quality in my test was a little bit better than the Olympus, but it has one important advantage, and that is that it focuses a lot closer. Close enough not to do one-to-one -one macro reproduction, but close enough to get a really nice close-up of flowers and other details. And I found it was good enough for me to use as a macro lens. And I'm always looking for, for lenses that can perform double duty. With this lens, this lens cannot focus very closely. So if I wanted to shoot close-ups, macro shots, I would need another, I would need to carry another lens. I don't want to carry another lens. I don't want the weight or the inconvenience. I really like that Panasonic 42.5, 1.7, because it is a great portrait lens. It is optically stabilized and it focuses very close. So that is my choice at the short telephoto end, unless you've got the kind of money to afford the Noctochron. So what kind of money are we talking about for these lenses? Well, that, that Olympus F1.8 is $300. Um, and as you said, that was, you know, for a long time, that was the, the lens. Uh, this uh, 42 and a half millimeter F1.7 is only $400. So it's only $100 more, probably the best bang for the buck in that category. And if you really need an Octocron, if you've got to have an F1.2, 42.5 millimeter, you can spend $1,500. But isn't it nice, again, that Micro Four Thirds is so established that it can have luxury options. So it can have budget options and luxury options. They're not saying this is the only option. There are multiple ones. And uh, going a little bit longer still is this lens, which is the Olympus 75mm f1.8. So this is equivalent to 150mm. So if you're using this as a portrait lens, uh, you know, you're, you're going to be standing quite far away. However, in turn, it does uh, produce a very, very shallow depth of field. You can use it just as a general telephoto. Again, it's very small. This, this is, you know, one of, one of the heavier and largest Micro Four Third lenses primes that are out there, but it's still small and light. I use this a lot for architecture, actually, from a distance um, or for getting, it, it's even, I even use it for landscapes, you know. But if you've got a subject who is willing to cooperate and pose for you, you can get some really nice portraits with this. And I know some portrait photographers who go, hmm, I could either buy the Noctocron and try and do it all with that, or I could get the Olympus um, 75 and one of the 45s or 42.5s, where you know, for, for the same money or even less. So speaking of money, how much is the 75 1.8? That's a $700 lens. Okay, so you could get this and the Lumix 42.5 1.7 and still have that combination for less than in the Notchcom. Yeah, very good, very good. So let's take a little diversion. Let's go a little bit off track. You mentioned, for example, that I could use that Lumix 42.5 millimeter F1.7 if I wanted to get fairly close, but not true one-to-one -one macro. But suppose I really want to do serious macro photography with a micro four thirds camera. What are my choices there? Well, if you want to be able to do one-to-one -one reproduction, which is, after all, the technical definition of a true macro lens, you have not one, not two, but three choices in the Micro Four Thirds format. Again, so many other formats will only give you one macro lens or two. There's three on Micro Four Thirds. So again, Panasonic came out very, very early on with another Lumix-like uh, combination, the optically stabilized 45 millimeter f2.8. It's quite a nice lens for a while. It was the only macro lens. It took ages before Olympus came out with its 60 millimeter f2.8. But then more recently, in fact, at the same time as the Lumix 42.5 1.7, Panasonic came out with another macro lens. It wasn't a Lumix Leica, it's just a Lumix lens. And it is a 30 millimeter f2.8. So let's look at what these lenses have in common. 
they're all f2.8 they all will do one-to-one -one reproduction the difference is is the focal length so we've got 30 45 and 60 millimeter remember you've got to double all of those so they become equivalent to 60 90 and 120 millimeter which in turn defines how far away you're going to be to achieve one-to-one -one reproduction. Now, with the 30 millimeter, you're, you've got to be pretty close to do that. So if you're photographing a poisonous bee, then you may feel more comfortable with the longer option of those three, with the 60 millimeter. However, if you don't mind getting really, really close, obviously you also have to worry about shadows when you get close. However, if, like me, you like your lenses to perform double duty, you may be thinking, well, I should go for one that I can use for something else. Now, the Olympus at 60 mil becomes 120. That could be a good kind of uh, telephoto portrait. But for me, I actually really like the Lumix 30 millimeter of 2.8 because it becomes an almost standard focal length. When I've got that lens on, I noticed when I was doing macro tests, I was actually lucky enough to be in one of the major flower markets in Amsterdam, which if you're ever in Holland or near Amsterdam, you should absolutely try and visit. You've got to get there pretty early in the morning, but you see all the flowers being uh, driven along, you know, and, and being packaged up. It is, it's, it's like going to a skiji fish market in Japan, except for flowers. And then nearby they've got where they grow them all. And there are obviously a lot of flowers there because that's where so many of them come from for the, for the whole world. And I was shooting, a lot of macro close-ups, but then I was able to just take pictures of my family or of the buildings because, of course, the 30 mil was close to a standard lens. So I found that, in fact, I barely took that lens off all day. Uh, so it became very, very flexible, and that, to me, made it more appealing. But, of course, it really is a specialist lens. It is, first and foremost, a macro lens. So choose it. Choose which macro lens based on how far away you want to be from your subject to achieve one-to-one. -one. So if you don't want to be too close, get the 60. Uh, if you don't mind getting close, get the 30. For me, the original Leica Lumix 45 is a bit, it's, it's overpriced now, I feel, unless you can get a good deal on it. Um, it's not, because it's now got competition at either end, that's not the compelling one. I'd go for the 32.8. Yeah, and that uh, that forty five millimeter Leica is the highest. It's five hundred and fifty dollars US. The sixty millimeter Olympus uh, is only four hundred dollars, and just below that, that Panasonic thirty millimeter f two eight comes in at three seventy. So um, uh, relatively close in price, but I, I agree with you. It sounds like the uh, the thirty millimeter Panasonic might be the the most flexible. Okay, so Gordon, you already talked about the Olympus 75 millimeter f1.8. That's a $700 lens. Starting to get up there into the into the longer focal lengths. But suppose I need to go longer than 75 millimeter. What are my choices? Okay, so early on, there were quite a few telephoto zooms available in the format, but they're generally kind of budget options. For me, of those, the best one was the Panasonic Lumix 100 to 300 millimeter f4 to 5.6. That is a kind of good budgetish telephoto option again timesing it by two that's giving you 200 to 600 millimeter reach but it is quite slow uh what sort of money are we talking about for that lens that's 525 us so that gives you a long reach at a kind of fairish price but if you don't need anything quite as long as that but you're after better quality and a brighter focal ratio there are some more recent options that are really good now Earlier, I mentioned a 12 to 35 and a 12 to 40 from Panasonic and Olympus, respectively, f2.8 lenses. Both companies do matching telephoto zooms for those. So in Panasonic's world, it's a uh, 35 to 100 f2.8. And in Olympus's world, it's a 40 millimeter to 152.8. So already you can see that those two Olympus lenses take you from 24 mil equivalent to 300 millimeter equivalent with a constant f2.8 focal ratio. And in fact, Olympus, going back to one of the first lenses, the uh, 7014 2.8, Olympus now has a pro grade system where with three lenses, you can go from 14 mil equivalent to 300 mil equivalent with a constant f2.8 focal ratio and weather sealing throughout. So this is a very compelling proposition. And for me, although the Lumix telephoto zoom is smaller and lighter, and may, depending on where you get it, may be cheaper. I just like having that extra reach on the Olympus. So for me, if you can afford it, the 40 to 150 millimeter f2.8 from Olympus is a really nice telephoto zoom. Yeah, and again, the uh, the Panasonic um, 525, I think I mentioned that, that Olympus 40 to 150 f2.8 
constant aperture, hundred uh, sorry, one thousand three hundred dollars. So, you know, more than double the price, but uh, and and not as long. You know, a lot of my friends like to shoot birds and wildlife, and one of the problems I've had convincing people to go mirrorless is the lack of long focal lengths. People who want to shoot nature. Uh, and animals and birds at a distance. And here now, the, the Panasonic getting up there to 300 millimeter or 600 equivalent, even that Olympus, 150 millimeter, 300 equivalent, we're getting you know pretty long. Um, they can really fit that bill. And there's some even longer lenses now. As we made this video, both Panasonic and Olympus uh, announced some new longer lenses. Panasonic, and I think it's another Lumix Leica collaboration, that has a new 100 to 400 millimeter zoom coming out and it again it's a premium option it's not going to be cheap but it's going to get very long you know i mean that's 800 millimeter equivalent at the long end that gives you a lot of reach olympus also has uh, a 300 millimeter f4 prime lens on its way this is the longest prime lens available for micro four thirds and interestingly it is the first olympus micro four thirds lens to have optical stabilization and this is olympus not admitting a fault with its system, but saying, look, the built-in stabilization is great in the bodies, but it's most effective at shorter focal lengths. There's only so much so far that sensor can shift inside the body. And as you are looking at longer and longer and longer lenses, those wobbles literally become more and more magnified. They require greater displacement to counteract them. This is one of the benefits of optical stabilization at longer focal lengths. You can optimize it for that higher power. And Olympus has decided that at 300 millimeter, it's okay. The stabilization isn't bad if you're using the built-in stabilization, but they could do it a lot better if they combine it with optical stabilization. So that lens has optical stabilization. It's going to give you 600 millimeter equivalent focal length. Again, in terms of depth of field, it's equivalent to F8. But in terms of exposure, and this applies throughout to everything that we've said today, the way the F number scale is designed is that F4 on one system is the same in terms of exposure as F4 on another system. So when Olympus described this as this being equivalent to a 600 mil F4 lens, it is in terms of exposure. In terms of what exposure and ISO you need, it is the same as a 600 mil F4 full frame lens on a Canon or a Nikon. In terms of depth of field though, it's equivalent to F8, but this is gonna be a very popular lens with wildlife photographers one of the really interesting benefits of Micro Four Thirds, say on the Panasonic side, is they have been pioneering, as you know from previous All About the Gear shows, 4K video and also the ability to grab 8 megapixel stills from 4K video. So imagine a scenario where you've got that 300mm f4 lens on a Panasonic body and you're not taking pictures of birds in a, on a distant tree, you're filming video of them. So you're filming video, the bird flies off or dives and, and grabs its prey if it's you know that kind of bird and you've captured all of that at 30 frames per second with 4k video and you can extract eight megapixel stills from that so i think the combination I, and i've seen people do this with adapted spotting scopes so this lens is going to give them that ability to do that with autofocus as well not great continuous af unfortunately on the system but at least you could get that initial lock so i think that's going to be a very popular lens uh, for bird photographers the 300 millimeter f4 I, I agree. And we should point out, you've said this, but I want to restate this, that the Panasonic 100 to 400 is an F4 to F6.3. But as you zoom in, it pretty rapidly is going to go towards that F6.3. So uh, unless you're shooting at the shorter focal length, you've got a relatively slow lens there. Uh, and if you're you know, if you're a serious bird photographer, nature photographer, you're used to shooting early in the morning or late in the day, that lens is starting to get a little slow. That Olympus 300 millimeter f4 um, is doesn't sound like a lot, but it's going to be quite a difference. And I'll, I'll bet the combination of in-body image stabilization, if you're using an Olympus body and optical image stabilization in the lens, I'll bet they do quite an interesting job in combining those two, don't they? Yeah, definitely. And I should also say, returning to the system as a whole, I'm going to show you a bag that I use. This is an f-stop. ICU, they call it an internal camera unit, and you can configure it how you like. It's just like a little a little box, really. And then this fits inside a rucksack. I can get my entire Micro Four Thirds system into this, and that consists of one or two bodies and six or seven lenses. 
I can even actually leave one of those bodies and maybe one of those lenses and get it in something that's half the depth. I can get that inside a rucksack with a load of clothes, water bottle, laptop, a ton of other things, and that is in the smallest backpack. And for me, that that is one of the most compelling messages about using not just mirrorless, but specifically micro four thirds, because the lenses are so small and yet are delivering very, very sharp quality across the frame. I'm very, very satisfied with it. And that, again, is why it's one of the main formats that I use for my own day-to-day -day photography. Very good. I want to wrap up the longer lenses by pointing out that that Panasonic 100-400 is $1,800 US. And for only $700 more, you could get the 300 millimeter Prime F4 at $2,500. Gordon, we've done a quite a good job. I'm going to put you on the spot. I didn't tell you I was going to do this. And I know how unfair this question is because I get asked this question all the time. You've bought a micro four thirds camera. You know where I'm going. You buy it, you get a micro four thirds camera, you get a kit zoom. What's the one lens without knowing what anybody's going to shoot? What's the one lens you would then go out and buy as your second lens? Okay, I would go for a 25, a bright 25 mil. And this actually also applies if you've got a DSLR. The first lens you get is a 50 mil f1.8. So it's sorry, the second lens you get is a bright standard prime. Uh, so for me, it would either be this Lumix 25 millimeter f1.4 or at a lower price, the Olympus um, 25 millimeter f1.7. They're standard lenses. You might be thinking, hang on a minute, I've already got that focal length in my range which is true, but you don't have it with this degree of quality and you definitely don't have it with this control over the depth of field and the beautiful rendering effects. For me, this is just such great general purpose lens and I frequently go out with just this lens alone. You know, I'm really disappointed. I was hoping for controversy or even controversy, but uh, I had already written on my notes that that was the same choice for me. I would uh, go out and get that. Really? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I would get that Lumix Leica 25 F1.4 for $600 US. So, oh, well, great minds think alike or something like that. Hey, uh, stand up a little bit and show us that shirt. Do you like this? I, I this love is, that shirt. That's me, actually. That's an x-ray of me holding a camera with my beanie hat. And it will be available at cameralabs.com along with another design uh, in 2016. So if you want to yeah. look like me, you can order one of these t-shirts. There you go. And uh, and I wanted to point that out because, as you can tell, Gordon spends uh, his entire life, he's abandoned his family, uh, his kids no longer know who he is, and uh, he spends all of his time, uh, pretty much, reviewing cameras and lenses for us over at cameralabs.com. I encourage you to go there to read reviews of these lenses in great detail. Hopefully, you didn't have to take notes because it's all there. And uh, I also encourage you, if you're interested in purchasing anything we discuss about here on All About the Gear, go over to cameralabs.com, click on the Buy Now links there. Um, you'll you'll ha help pay the child support. No, that's not fair to say. <laughs> that doesn't sound good. I'll pay the lens support. So I pay the, buy lens the lens support, absolutely. Yeah. Gordon, it has been a pleasure as always. I think uh, we've, we've helped me understand the world of micro four thirds lenses and hopefully our, our listeners and viewers as well. Glad to be of service. As always, a pleasure. Thanks, Gordon. Bye-bye.